All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters Madness and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with actor Kali Rocha about Broadway, Buffy, the Salem Witch Trials, Waco, Daniel Day Lewis, improv, method acting, and more. As always, thank you for listening. And if you'd like to help the show grow, please leave us a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Boils and ghouls, this is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Khalid, just so we have a platform to jump from here, uh, take us back in time to when you were a youngster. Are you a book reader, Mm -hmm. fort builder, troublemaker, or all the above? I was definitely a book reader. I loved stories about, there was a book, a series by Maud Hart Lovelace called Betsy, Tacey, and Tib. That was about three girls in the 18, well, I guess it was turn of the century. So, and that was magic. I love that. And I guess I did build forts, but... I don't remember doing that a ton, but it, it, I did enjoy it when they were made. But I was not a troublemaker. <laughs> not at all. Did you have a genre that you leaned towards more when you were reading? Were you a fantasy, horror, you know, what have you? So my aunt once said to me as a kid, I get, she told me this recently, that you had, she said you always had to be careful what you told Kali because she could imagine it to be true. It's not that I thought it was true. It's just that immediately I could imagine it was true. And she said my eyes would just get bigger and bigger as, as somebody told me a story. And I was like, ah! Because I guess I always had a very strong imagination. So this is to say horror was just a little too real. I didn't have a good separation device for like, that's just on a movie. Someone getting stabbed 10 times. Like I was like, huh, poor guy. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Understandable. So, <laughs> you know, so I wouldn't say horror. I would say definitely I enjoyed stories about kids having adventures in sort of any time period. Just kids running around. This is a silly thing to add, but I went on a field trip as a kid. It was like, I don't know where we went, some to a beach or something like that. We were all walking in a line over this grassy hill, and there was a wheelbarrow on its side. It was just abandoned. It was just, you know. And I went to this whole thing. I remember this imaginative sort of jag where I was like, I could live in that abandoned wheelbarrow. All you'd have to do is just, I could sleep in there. I just had this whole thing, gather berries. But like, to me, it was like amazing to think about it, living in a different time where you harvest this off the land and there was no electricity, you know. So in a way, that's, you know, fantasy adventure, but less rooted in horror, (laughs) more in sort of just a different time, just people and different resources. Right. Well said. So when you do think back to the, you know, formative films and TV shows from your childhood, what comes to mind initially? (laughs) Strangely, my father, (laughs) who's an artist, and we used to love to go to this little art house film place called The Bijou. We saw Fanny and Alexander there. Did you ever see that? I didn't. I didn't know. Crazy. It is not appropriate (laughs) for a child. But it is kind of a horror film, actually. I think it's a Dutch director, or I know it's a European director, and it's about a brother and sister who are just, it's totally dark, and it's really weird. But that I loved. I just thought that was fascinating. And then I do remember I absolutely loved Amadeus. I mean, Mm. I just, you know, there you go. Like that was, it was historical in its own way, but absolutely magical with the costumes and the food. She was eating like nipples of Venus. I just was like, oh my God, this looks amazing. That was key to me. I mean, obviously not as a child child. And I was raised on, I didn't have a television in my mom's home, but at my dad's place, which was really my grandparents' place, we watched TV. 
And so I would watch a lot of sitcoms. My brother and I would just binge on like the Jeffersons and mm. Hogan's Heroes and Smash. And we'd go into school and be like, what's up, Weezy? Like Red Fox show. People were like, those are reruns. That's in syndication. I was like, oh my God, we thought we were so cool. <laughs> but So it was a weird mix. It was a weird mix of stuff. So you seem to like, uh, and in fiction and in films, you seem to like period pieces. Did you reenact it all growing up? No, I never did. I never did. But I will say I did a, I mean, of course, like I had a corset. I'm sure I had a corset and a hoop skirt, if that's a tribute. But <laughs> yes, and I would put on shows for my cousins and stuff. But no, interestingly, I did a film, Gods and Generals, which was is a Civil War drama. And it we filmed in Hagerstown, Maryland and Virginia, stuff like that. And there were hundreds of reenactors as part of that. And I'm just adding this story, but I remember I had to walk back from this train and then cut through the crowd to get to my beginning start, my starting spot for a scene. So I had done the scene, got off the train, was walking back through the crowd of reenactors, and three. I was playing Anna Morris and Jackson, Stonewall Jackson's ah, wife. Okay. And so I remember these three young soldiers took off their hats and said, "Mona, Miss Jackson." And I curtsied and I said, Mona, gentlemen, thank you for your duty to your country. <laughs> and we just kept walking. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I love this life. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> My wife is actually, a, she's been reenacting since she was young. And her troop was actually involved on The Last of the Mohicans production and helped <gasps> a lot of that. So that's why I was just wondering. You know, sometimes oh, they cross yeah. over. Yes, exactly. Well, I, but I mean, I don't know your wife's childhood, but I imagine like it's a, it is a fantasy come true. To be able to put those, I mean, it's a, I'm an actress. I'm talking about wearing a corset and a hoop skirt now on screen, mm -hmm. you know, going through these reenactors. I mean, it was, it, it is, we're all acting out that childhood dream of, oh my God, this is close, as close as I will be to having lived in the 1800s. So what sort of music was playing around the house? Did you guys spin a lot of records or anything like that? That's a great question because it was spin a record time. Thank you. I love to dance. I really love to dance. And so I would roll up the rug. We had a strangely large living room that had really not much furniture in it, but a rug. And I'd roll it up and I would play, <laughs> I would play chorus line. Okay. Also Thriller. That was big. <laughs> and I would just dance. And also Evita. It was a weird mix. But so... I would have all these records just going of different shows and stuff like that. And I would just dance and dance and dance. And I remember my, my mother and brother kind of just staring at me like, what do we have in our house? Other than that, I remember it was like my mother had the classical station playing. Not a lot of music going except for what I was doing. But So your mom and dad, your parents, were they artistically inclined at all? Maybe involved with the business at all? Not at all involved in the business. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. Mm. And my dad is an artist. They're separated. They're divorced when I was very young. So my dad is an incredible visual artist and he is in Massachusetts. And so I would say I, I am artistic. I mean, visually, I, I make I have a jewelry line. Like I'm, I love to, I do a new drawing class once a week. Like I love to draw, I love creating. I'm always making stuff. My mom was definitely an arts appreciator. She took me to the theater constantly and to concerts and we had a lot of art in our house, you know, stuff like that. But she herself, I wouldn't say is, a, is an artist. She's an appreciator of it. It's safe to say, you know, you were a theater drama kid. <laughs> when, yeah. when does the interest arise? Like how early on are we talking? Well, I did always draw. I mean, I did always dance. I did always draw, but I did always dance. And then I remember it was pretty formative. When I was eight years old, I was at a summer camp and I was cast as Annie. And it was like a really big deal. But I think what was even weirder, at least to my mother, because I wasn't academically inclined particularly. I'm mean, smart, but I wasn't great in school. But is that they gave us our scripts, which was like a 60 page script, you know, mm. whatever. And I memorized it overnight. And my mom was like, okay, hold on. You just, you're eight years old and you memorize it. Why can you not apply that to school? And I was like, because I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was a turning point where I realized, and my father even said it, that he and I guess some friends were watching and he said, oh my God, I think, I think she could do like, this is, she's good at this. So that was a turning point. And then I did a lot of Shakespeare in college. I did dance in junior high school, sorry, Shakespeare in high school. And then I went to Carnegie Mellon for acting. And I think that was a moment, too, of like, I auditioned there and at NYU. And then I actually applied to several other liberal arts schools. But getting into Carnegie Mellon, I was like, oh, I kind of have to do this. I felt like a, an invitation I couldn't refuse. When you're on stage, does your approach as an actor differ 
as opposed to when you're on screen? Is there any difference for you there? Mm, that's an interesting question. I mean, one reason, and I'm sure a lot of actors say this about why they love the stage, is that there's another character, and that's the audience. You yes. know, so you have it's much more presentational, but you have the relationship and the reaction of the audience, or not. But at least there's a living organism there that's interacting with you and not radically changing your performance, but feeding you in some way. So in that way, there's probably another antenna out listening to that energy from the audience when you're on stage, at least for me. And also there's a whole lot more rehearsal, mm -hmm. which I heard somebody when I came to LA after doing a lot of theater in New York, someone and they're like, I don't know if I like theater. It's like, you have so much time to rehearse. And I was like, okay, hold on. <laughs> because it's a whole other technique. You know, it's like, the whole point you rehearse is not to get it to be wooden and mechanical, but so that you can tell a story in two and a half hours or whatever that is fleshed out and has a director's eye towards building the beats and the story and the telling of the, you know, totally different than on film, on screen, where I'm not, my job is not to thread together the whole story of the plot of the, you know, my, I'm, I'm a cog in the wheel. Right. So I would say everything becomes much smaller, hopefully. I think I had to learn that because I'd done so much theater and then I, and I had these big cow eyes. I had to be like, oh, okay, bring it up, bring it on down. So just much smaller, quieter, less forced. Again, it's much more about what you bring as a personality to the part because you don't have that audience kind of breathing with you in it. Both are amazing and both require a high level of discipline that I think it's easy to think, oh, theater, you have to be disciplined in film and TV. You can just kind of schlep on if you know your lines. But it's still an incredible craft that requires a lot of self-knowledge, I think, to do it. Just sticking on acting for a second, this is something I like to bring up to everyone. You know, as a layman, you know, folks that aren't actors, we hear the term method acting thrown out a lot. I've learned that if you ask an actor their method, it's going to be different from the next actor you ask. So what does the term method acting mean to you and what is your method? Wow, actually, that's a very interesting question that I have been thinking about a lot because currently on TV is the series Waco, The Aftermath on Showtime. And so in it, I play Ruth Riddle, who is a survivor of Waco. And we're on trial. And I'm on trial with three other people. And I just love those actors. Kolei Okolev, Michael Luoye, and John Huguenacher. And we really got close during that because it was a lot of very high emotion, as you can imagine, a lot of history shared that was not written in it because, of course, you can't show it all. There are flashbacks, so that was, we were able to layer into that. But we did talk about method acting. It's become kind of a joke. I hate to say that, but like, oh, he's really method, yeah. or like, you know, Joaquin Phoenix never leaves his character or whatever. And, and actually, I just heard an interview with him on Smart List where he was saying, like, I don't know. Everybody just does what they do. Just do what you do, and if it's good, it's good. If it's not, it's not. So, in a way, my feeling was, and it fit well with Carnegie Mellon, that you don't have to subscribe to one particular strict method. Stanislavski, you know, like, you don't have to ascribe to one particular way. What they taught us was pull together technique that allows you to access the truth of a character. Mm. So it doesn't have to be labeled anything, but if you like to think about your father dying and also imagine what this character with their history would feel and weave those two things together, great, whatever works for you. So on Waco, we talked a lot about it because we each had to find our own way to these really, really emotional scenes. And it was just a big mix of stuff for me. So I would say it was my own method. And I don't know that it would translate to someone else because also I've had very specific experiences that I pulled on that nobody else would have felt so it wouldn't feed that so you know i think it's a deeply personal thing and i'm curious what other actors say about it because i think at the end of the day there's no right or wrong if what you're doing is believable and compelling and from a place of humility and honesty and truth then whatever method you're using is working would you say that that changes from job to job for you well, certainly if you're doing a sitcom, mm, especially yeah. if you're doing a guest spot on a sitcom, which I just did one, and it was like, listen, am I going to write a whole notebook's worth of backstory for this dentist on that girl, Lele? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> but it doesn't mean I'm any less respectful. Like, I, the text is important. The comic beats are important. Collaborating with the other actors is important. You know, not trying to steal the show. is You know, there's other things in place that are equally as important i think but it is true that when you're doing a drama i think you do have to you have to flesh it out 
either on screen or on stage. And not to say as a comedy, you don't, you know, I think you do have to figure out your relationships, but it's just a slightly different requirement and depth. Sort of in the same vein, you know, I've had some actors, like one that comes to mind is Armin Shimmerman. He said, you know, there's been one or two instances throughout his career where he can't necessarily remember the uh, the physical performance of the play itself mm-hmm. that he was so locked in. Maybe he remembered mm-hmm. just the costume and set changes, but not being on stage and saying his lines. Has that ever, has that ever happened to you before? Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. I had an acting teacher, Joan Darling, in college who said, if you, and I'm, this is no slam on, she said, if you, re- if you really believe that you're in the trenches and it's 1945 and a bomb is about to come, you're crazy. You're not acting. You're crazy. And so I've always tried to find that balance for myself. I guess you give, you give over to the story you're telling. You know, let's just say for in a play. You give over to it, but there's always one foot firmly rooted in reality, the technique that you've learned, the emotional arc of the character that the director has set you on, the text, the, you know, the relationship to the other actors. So for me, it's not to say I haven't had moments of liftoff. I've definitely had moments where I was like, oh my God, this is insane. Like I did The Crucible. We were literally in a courtroom that had been made by Daniel Day-Lewis came and like whittled the wood and put it you know and it was like we were on a wildlife refuge Jesus which I didn't know chopped that down for yeah it was it was Ipswich Island off the coast of Danbury Massachusetts so every morning to film we stayed in Danbury we would in the dark take a boat go to this island they had backbred cattle to look like cattle from the 1600s it was like it was ins- it was insanely authentic I mean my dress which was like a purpley blue had been dyed with mulberries and they never washed it during filming. So it was like, I mean, we went, we went really deep in that. And there were definitely moments in, let's say the courtroom scenes where there was just a sense of like, oh my God, we're, we're there. We're, we're weirdly there, but we weren't there. I mean, Winona Ryder's in the front row, like we're going to catering, you know, we're taking a boat back and calling our moms. Like it's not, it's tricky to, in, in answer to your question, of, I know it's long winded, but like, I think it is magical to feel as close to transported as you can possibly get. But I think it is your responsibility to maintain the arc of what you're saying, you know, because and, and doing and, and the story that you're telling. I guess to me, the story is really important in that way that if I really just lift off and forget where I am, then I don't know if I'm if I'm really maintaining the structure of what I'm supposed to be telling. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And uh, since you mentioned The Crucible, let's just talk about that. We yeah. just brought up method acting. You know, Daniel Day-Lewis is one of the guys that gets brought up a lot with that. So Indeed. I spoke with Kevin J. O'Connor. He worked with Daniel on uh, There Will Be Blood. And he yeah. sort of mentioned how working with Daniel up the pressure on him, like internally to perform. Mm-hmm. Is that fair to say that you had the same experience with him? Well, I not only worked with him, but I guess because my character, it was my first film, and my character didn't have a ton of lines but she, there was a lot of screen time so i was basically playing i was playing mercy lewis who is abigail's window and writer's character's best friend right hand man in all of the stuff in just everything she's dancing naked in the forest she's accusing wives of being witches she's in the courtroom with her you know it's just a lot of it was perfect actually because it was like a lot of training but not a lot of lines and kind of yeah, anyway i learned a lot about stuff i because i didn't have a lot of lines but they wanted to see if i could act I had to audition with him. <laughs> wow. So I read Winona's lines with him for the audition. And I got to say, like, I was 23 or something. I mean, that was like a moment I'll never forget. I will say he could not have been lovelier. We actually had a lot in common. I was heading the next day to France and he had lived in France or his, I don't know, wife was, I don't some some connection there. So we spoke a lot about that. Once we started filming, it is true that he retreated much more into his character and i appreciated that i could people we kind of all stayed away from him he carried a carving knife and a stick to whittle because his character is a carpenter so he had that he would just sit there during breaks and do that you know and then i actually was able to socialize with him a bit on that and he was not like still john proctor at the brunch table i mean you know he was able to talk uh, (laughs) with me but i appreciated and respected his that that works for him that mm-hmm. that total immersion, I mean, as I say, he went up, this was a wildlife refuge, we were given permission to chop half of it down. So because his character, he wanted to build the muscles of someone that did that job. So he went up and cut down half of the forest with the construction workers for the set. I mean, that's hardcore. 
Yeah, it but is. But I will say, really hardcore. But, you know, I will say, I don't know if, you know, for Waco, I didn't, I, I did a lot of, lot of research on the people, the Branch Davidians who lived at Waco. And so I stopped shaving. I didn't drink or have caffeine, certainly vamping up to filming. And then as we got further along in it and we had done the flashbacks, I was able to incorporate like coffee in the morning, tea in the morning, and then a glass of wine on the weekend, you know. But I really tried to adhere to a sense of like that kind of a world. I mean, it does inform, even on a very subtle way, it does inform your performance. And I don't think there's anything wrong with trying it for yourself. Right. So with The Crucible, it's similar to how you're speaking about the new Waco series. So it's Crucible, the same thing. Even though it's the Arthur Miller play, it's 100, 100 years ago, this tragedy. Did you dive mm -hmm. into Mercy Lewis the same way? Did you look into those transcripts or anything like that? I did. I did. I totally did. Yeah, that was really trippy. I mean, I'm from Providence, Rhode Island, as I mentioned. Um, my husband's from Connecticut. We grew up with Salem witch trials, yeah. you know, and we know that history very deeply. My dad lives in Massachusetts, so there's a lot of like, I mean, every building has like Seamus O'Connor, 1756, lived here with his wife, and you know, so there's just a lot, a lot, a lot of history that you're that you grow up with that you don't even realize. So when it came time to do the film, I understood sort of the Puritan base that I was asked to tap into. It wasn't very foreign to me. Somehow this like old, sturdy New England philosophy of puritanical living, of deep, deep faith. I mean, that wasn't true in my family per se, but like deep belief in, at that point, the supernatural, like that was a big thing. I mean, what else did people have to explain? It's like Greek myths. Like what else did people have to explain things that were happening? And so that was pretty saturated. I did read court transcripts. I had always been fascinated by the sin witch trials. Always makes me laugh because people say, did you play a witch? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> there were no witches. The whole point is that there were no witches. <laughs> but I loved it. I mean, it felt very it felt very familiar to me. All of the younger girls, that pack of girls that is accusing women of being witches, and men, from New England. So we all were of the cloth. You know, it was very interesting. Lee, I'm a huge Buffy fan, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. I have to uh, thank for, off top a uh, friend and fan of the show, April. She pointed out to me that Halfrick was not your first role. I never made the, it never just clicked with me, you know, uh, William and Cecily. So uh -huh. what was the, was that a typical audition for you? And how did Halfrick come about afterwards? Mm, that's a great question. I know you uh, you um, interviewed James Marston, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marston's, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's so lovely. Love okay, him. So I'll, Love I can him. talk about love talk about him it actually loops in with theater because we talked a lot about theater because yeah, he, I, I he spoke about Macbeth for about 40 it. minutes that interview <laughs> likewise likewise are you kidding me likewise yeah. so funny gosh I hope has he ever done it he has to do it I think when I was working with him he wanted to do Hamlet but I was in New York as I said acting doing a lot of plays I had done some some film and TV. Actually, the reason I moved to LA was because I had done a small part in Meet the Parents. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, I'd always toyed with the idea of moving to LA from New York, but I didn't think I was going to move because of that. But a producer did say, I think this movie is going to be a big deal. And I think that that scene actually is more, I don't know what she said, more pivotal than you think or something more meaning. I don't know what, but I would suggest you move to LA. And I was like, oh, okay. So I came out to LA for four, thinking I'd be here for four months. Of course, that was 25 years ago. But uh, it was a great entryway to have meet the parents sort of there as like a calling card. But a week after I got here, I got an audition for a British 1800s wearing a corset and ringlets and a hoop skirt. And I was like, oh, done. Like basically because it was like theater. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, great, I can do that. Like, this will be fun. It's a guest spot on a show that, frankly, I had never watched up to that point. I, I didn't watch much TV. So I went in and I did my thing and I got it. And then, of course, the whole, it was, I think, two or three days of work, but it was all with James Marsters and it was amazing. And it was dreamy. And he, and again, we talked so much about theater and he knew I had literally seven days before arrived from New York. So we had just so much to talk about. And it was great. And I felt like I was on stage. You know, it felt like she's British, old, da, 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 it was all that. And then it just kind of went away. Like it was on air, of course, but I didn't think much more about it. And then a year later, I was filming something. I remember I was walking on the streets of New York at night, walking back to my hotel and I got a call because it was three hours earlier in LA, of course, from my agent saying, they want you to come back. Now, I want to say this once and for all. It isn't definitively proven 
that Halfrick is the same person as Cecily. Although most people, I guess, seem to think that, but that, that, that. Anyway, so they basically, at the time, I remember saying it's a different character. And I was like, oh, okay, sounds great. I'll love to, you know. So I went back as the Vengeance Demon Halfrick, and it was a lot, there was a lot of conversation about is, is she the same? Is she the same? Is she the same person? Is she not the same person? And, you know, I, we basically decided we don't know. And then there was that one moment, which sounds like what your friend is mentioning, which yes. is, yes, Cecily, right, William. We, I mean, we love that. We just loved it, loved it, loved it. So I think it's clear that she probably is the same person, but it was never discussed and it was never, I was never told like, yes, you are the same person, you know? Right, right. But I think, you know, James and I enjoyed the idea that it, that it was and that we just caught a whisper of like, you know, it was so fun. That was so, so fun. We'll just leave it up to the fans and let them think what they want to think then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sounds great. Keep talking about it. I love that. Talking is great. Let's do that. With method acting, like we were talking about earlier, when you have extensive makeup, does that help? Mm. Is that something that helps you, like, you're a vengeance demon, you're like, all right, well, what is a vengeance demon? Then you look in the mirror and you're like, oh, well, that's what it is. <laughs> that's it. Sinews and contacts. And, yeah, that was amazing. I, I will tell a funny story, which is that, you know, I didn't care one way or the other with the makeup. Like, I wasn't, I didn't know it was going to be that that extreme and sort of horrifying but it made sense and it, it absolutely added to but I liked playing against it because like you know if you go around like arr, 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 you know that's not that doesn't I mean yes you're matching the physical self that you have on but I think it was funny to be kind of still quirky and weird like a normal person but a vengeance demon you know yeah, yeah. and pe petty and self-centered and a vengeance demon you know so I enjoyed playing not against it exactly but still trying to play the character and then not really even like playing into the prosthetics let's say but the funny story is that it took about maybe two and a half hours to put that on and so i would always like show up on set and then emma caulfield and i would do our scenes we really liked each other we'd get along you know just chat chat laugh laugh like old girlfriends just really enjoyed each other enjoyed playing the scenes you know and then one day i guess we actually decided to sort of like walk back the makeup and i'm not sure emma liked it anyway i mean it is a process and it's not fun taking it off and and i understand on a show that she was like not enjoying that which was lucky for me because then of course that meant that i didn't have to wear it <laughs> so one day we'd done several several episodes together and one day i was in that we were called to work at the same time and i was sitting in the chair next to her just getting mascara you know just regular makeup and i was trying to talk to her and she was being like colder than i remember her being like she was just being like mm -hmm, yeah and i was like emma it's kali halfrick and she was like oh my God. like she start, almost started crying she's like i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i didn't know who you were <laughs> she had no idea who was talking to her because she had never seen me without Alfred prosthetics <laughs> on. And she just felt terribly. And she was not, she's such a lovely person, but she didn't know why this person to her right was like chatting with her like an old girlfriend, <laughs> then, you know? And she realized who I was. It was so funny. It was so, so funny. So I was glad that we could sort of phase out on that because it wasn't, it was not fun taking it off. They had to peel, pour mineral oil peel on the hairs on my arms. And, you know, uh -huh. it was, it was hard. I did enjoy it, but it was hard after a while. Well, you said you didn't watch Buffy, but I think, you know, Buffy's at least five, six seasons deep at this point, a ratings juggernaut. Were you aware of, like, its cultural impact at all or how popular it was? I was only aware of it when I told people I'd gotten the job. That I would say that was where I was like, oh, is this a big deal? Like, I'm a little slow. I, I mean, I don't, not slow, but, like, I'm behind the eight ball on popular culture. So, again, like, sure, I was in Meet the, I knew I was, I knew I had done a really fun scene, two scenes with Ben Stiller, but it didn't occur to me, like, it would be anything. Like, I almost passed when my, my manager called me about that. And he was like, no, 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 hold on. Take the job. Like, this is going to be a big deal. Like, I'm a little bit, I don't know, I just don't have my finger on the pulse. So, with mm. Buffy, I certainly realized how big a juggernaut it was when I told people, oh, I have this fun part on, on Buffy. Like, people went crazy. But at the time, I didn't, I didn't really know. I really didn't know. I thought, this is fun. This guy's really cool. I think he plays a vampire. Anyway, you know, like, I mean, it was, I just was a little bit out of it. And then as it grew, in, like, as my character grew and I kept that, that's when I really realized, like, oh, this is, I'm part of something really meaningful that, P.S. I've come to realize, and I know this is, sounds grandiose, but Joss Whedon's write, like the writing on those shows and the themes that are interwoven, I'm preaching to the converted probably right now, but like it's a little like Shakespeare. Like 
there are things that adults will get. There are things that young adults will get. There are things that teenagers will get. Like there's many chords that strike. And I didn't realize that until I was doing it and saw the different people that like the show and are drawn to the show. And then when I did conventions, I really, really got a sense of how much this show has not only spoken to people, but people said I saved their lot, like helped people, you know, in ways that, that we can't even even know. So I was very proud to be part of it, for sure. We're pushing oh, oh, near 30 years since Buffy, and it's still still relevant. People still love it. still cons and all that good stuff. It's kind of nuts. It is. I love it. I mean, bravo. Just to back up a little bit, I wanted to ask you about your first night on Broadway and how you felt internally. Was there any nerves, anything like that? <sighs> Okay, so I graduated from Carnegie Mellon, but a week before that, we had all gone as a class to New York to audition for agent. They, you, you do this thing called like leagues, where as a class, and it was like 12 of us, we auditioned for a room of like managers, agents, casting directors, whatever. And then what's great is you get a packet, call us, we're interested, you know, so then you're just set up. It's fantastic. And one of those people was the casting director at Lincoln Center. And that was my first job. I went in. It's such a crazy story, but I ended up getting it, this part. And it was uh, Liev Shriver's first show. He had just graduated from Yale. It was with Diane Weist and Francis Conroy from Six Feet Under. I mean, it was incredible. I have to say, I was 21. Like, I have to say that that particular character, that experience, that quickly, the way it just came out of college. Like, I was employed. Like, you're told that you're going to be waiting tables for the rest of your life. And then suddenly I was like, da-da-da. it just felt enchanted, mm. you know, and I had nerves, but I I have always felt very, very comfortable on stage. Uh, I love auditioning. If I know what I'm doing, like if I feel solid in the part, it's it's just all systems go. So it felt very right. I wasn't like, oh, do I belong here? It's Broadway. You know, I was like, I belong here. It's Broadway. You know, I really felt invited. It was a great character. They needed a manic, depressive Vivian Lee type. And I was like, I am your girl. <laughs> okay. So, so, so I felt confident going into it, you know. You mentioned uh, working with Ben Stiller. You know, everyone who's seen Meet the Parents knows exactly the scene you're talking about. Uh, one of the most memorable scenes of the movie. Was there a lot of improv going on? How many takes did it, did you guys do? That's hilarious. I, I, it's so funny because I really did almost pass on taking the part. Like, I, I remember the audition was way, way west, like almost on the river in New York City in a warehouse with Susie Ferris, who I think at the time was an assistant to a casting director. She now isn't a very successful casting director, but, you know, so it was me and her and a, and a television uh, camera. The scene was very short. I mean, I think it was like, you know, I don't even remember my dogs are barking. I don't remember exactly what the lines were, but it was not much. And we did it a couple different ways and we had some fun and then that was it. And then as these things go, several months later, I got the call, you have got the part. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be, I don't need to be like an extra. I mean, you know, I was not being snobby, but I was just like, I don't know, let's be Let's, I was doing a play. I was like, let's just, and again, my agent said, uh, I think, I think maybe take a second look at this because it's, you'll be opposite Ben Stiller and it's a Jay Roach film and it's good. So I showed up on set and they had changed, they had, they had fleshed out the scene and added another scene. So the bones of it had changed completely from the time I had auditioned and they allowed us to improvise to answer your question. So Ben and I improvised. And I can't explain what that is like. I mean, it was it's like playing tennis with John McEnroe and every one of your tennis balls lands exactly where you thought it was going to land. Like it, it's you can't believe what's happening. You can't think too much about it. Otherwise, you'll just hit it off the edge of the racket and it'll you know, like you just have to keep doing what you know that you do well. And I just we just played, we played, we played. So part of it was certainly scripted. But a lot of it was improvised. Mm. And I mean, that was just sheer magic. And I was doing a play at the time. And I remember going back because I had had to skip a day or something. Of, I forget. I didn't have an understudy going. I think it was in rehearsals. But just when we were talking about it. And I was like, you guys, that was crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was, I just knew it was a bananas experience that I had had. But still, I didn't know what the film would, would be. And I certainly didn't know sort of like how weirdly crafted, as Jay, Ra Jay Roach later told me, he's like, you gave us our third act we needed a third act and that was what it, it hinged on you know which you don't know that when you're filming something and when you're 
schlepping around a backpack and combat boots and making $200 a week. Like you're just thinking about the play, you know, and then you're offered this thing and you do it and you don't know where anything's going. Right. So it was a really interesting experience of I did my, I yes, I went in, we improvised. I knew it was really fun. I knew he's a heavy hitter. I knew his work, obviously. I felt received by him in such a lovely way, but you don't know what it's going to be. You're absolutely right. It did, it did end up being a, a, kind of a big deal i mean i still people still talk about it and it makes me laugh so ridiculous so had you had any improv experience at all prior to that or was ben stiller your first improv partner <laughs> <laughs> yeah right, right. a workshop i got paid for i feel like i did i guess it, you know i feel like i did because there's no way i could have done it. i mean, I think it comes naturally anyway to me but after that i did some work with the groundlings i didn't take their course but i was invited to be a guest you know artist whatever so afterwards, I had, I would say, actual training, but or sort of did it. But before that, I mean, you know, you do a bit of that in school, mm. for sure. No, that was after I wrote a show with friends of mine that was improvised and then crafted into a, a script. But no, not really. I mean, I just but I think if you're any kind of a funny person and have a quick brain, then you are able to improvise. <laughs> you know, I just think it's not, it's not, not to say it's not an art form. It is. And I think once I got into those things, like the groundlings, I think I realized like, oh, I don't actually know the rules. But for that, for that purpose, it worked out. It worked out great. With the uh, new Waco TV series, was that a typical audition mm -hmm. as well? Well, so because of COVID, <laughs> All of my auditions, and God bless my amazing husband, he's a sound mixer. He bought all the gear. We have a ring light. I'm not using it now, clearly. <laughs> but we have all the gadgetry, and it is a corner of our child's playroom that happens to have two white walls that, you know, it all. that's where all my auditions are now. So this was really at the height of COVID, and I was pretty tired of saying, Kali Rocha, 5'6", Los Angeles, California. You know, that you're just used to doing your tapes. You send them in, whatever. I read, I don't think there was a script, but I read the sides. And of course, I had watched the first season of Waco and thought it was amazing. And I just decided this character was not someone who wore makeup. You know, for these on-camera stuff, things you're used to just like, there's a face you do. You do the lashes, you do your hair, you curl it up, you do the thing. You, the idea is to look marketable. Right. And obviously, a woman living at the Branch Davidian compound in Waco in 1992 and three is not, is not, I mean, I knew what that was. So I just did that. I kind of treated it like a play. It was two scenes. I really, I did research the actual woman, Ruth Riddle. So I pitched her voice. I did a little bit of, it's very quick, but a little bit of research that you can do in two days when you get the audition and have to do it. And then I just sent that in. And then with credit to John Dowdle, who is, John and Drew Dowdle created the Waco series. They just cast me off the tape. I never met with them. I don't think they knew much about my background. They were just basing their auditions and their offers on what they saw people do on their tape. And I know this for a fact because, because Michael Luoye, who plays one of the other survivors, he plays Livingstone Fagan, he had been, he was the first African-American, he was the third Hamilton on Broadway, the first African-American Hamilton on wow. Broadway. Amazing. I mean, the dude can sing. He's also an extraordinary actor. But we had a scene where we all are singing on a bus. We didn't actually all know the words to the song. So we kept turning to Michael Luoye because he's a singer and he knows that, you know, so we kept like the joke was we turned to him and he would. Be, so when the director came on, he said, you guys, that was great. That was really, really great. And we said, well, we were all turning to Michael. He's like, oh, do you sing? And I was like, see, this is why I love you. Because he didn't know that Michael Luoye was Hamilton on Broadway. <laughs> he didn't care about the credits. It wasn't about the resume and the star and the points and the, 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 the. it was about what did they see on the tape that they responded to that would serve this story and was the character and that's off to them for that i like to ask all actors you know i'm a writer and there's a lot of potential screenwriters and stuff out there as someone who's had a shit ton of scripts in your hand what are some good indicators that you have a good one in your hand and what are some red flags wow that's a great question i too have tried my hand at writing and realized that just because I'm I think I'm good with dialogue and I think I know what funny moments are I think that everybody can be a writer I don't and I think I'm a good writer but I'm not that is a whole other art form to structure a screenplay that in answer to your question doesn't condescend to the audience but also doesn't isn't just too smart by half I guess I respond to scripts where there is a, definitely a sense that not too much is told right away that it isn't that I like scripts where the writer doesn't feel like a, another character in the story. Humility, I guess, where mm. it's really the characters 
are slowly, and that's an operative word, slowly revealing themselves to you. And that I find a character that has opposites within it, even Ruth Riddle, I would say, on some level, extreme, she, from Waco, like, I responded because on some level, she is a very, very shy, sheltered person, but she's also a badass. Mm. I mean, and I love that. And uh, although it's not featured in Waco, and I'm, and I'm offering this because it was part of her background, so it was part of the appeal of the script. She is, in real life, Ruth Riddle jumped from the second story of a burning building of Waco to deliver the writings of David Koresh. So she risked, she jumped out of a burning building. She's a badass. But so I definitely incorporated that. And I like that the writers, even though that's not shown, the writers got it, that she's two oppositional things, because I think people are. And I think that shows a sophistication as a writer, if you're able to represent people, not as a function, but as a bunch of dualities that are, I think, much much more sort of accurate than the writer saying this person has to represent this but that that feels like the writer imposing their world on so what is the best acting advice you've received and who gave it to you Mm, that's a really good question i'm remembering i did a workshop at sundance i don't think i was very good in the piece that i was casting but i was having a hard time accessing something and christine lottie i don't know if you know her she was she's an amazing actress but she's in running on empty with judd hirsch but she came in she reminded me of my acting teacher at Carnegie Mellon too, but it's like, basically she was like, stop indicating and just talk. Because actors, a lot of times when you don't feel, I wasn't connecting to what I was saying, but I knew it had to be an emotional thing. And if you can't connect emotionally, you indicate, you're like, yeah, I just, I just really feel, you know, do all this other garbage around it. I don't know what I was doing. But the idea that you just tell the truth and you don't put yourself, all your junk around it, because people don't do that, in the, especially in a heightened moment. It's almost rabbit. It's almost animal. I mean, that's, you know, it is animal. It's an an instinct pushing through to express something as opposed to like all these other tricks and stuff that actors do sometimes to couch it or to do what they've seen on TV or that, you know, I've seen this a lot, which is like, I'm going to cry. And I don't know. I mean, why are you worried about your mascara? You know, why are you, (laughs) why are you being careful? Your makeup doesn't like cry. Let it stream down your face. That's what people do. Things like that. I think it was the stop indicating and just tell the truth. Was Janet Morrison was an acting teacher at Carnegie Mellon. And I remember Christine Lottie saying something similar. And I think, I think it was very, very helpful. Now, this is something I like to ask everyone because you never know what they're going to say. Have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Well, this is too long a story, but I've had in the past moment, uh, periods where I had to be, I had, had surgery, brain surgery. Right. And I'm fine. Totally fine. But it was a recurring thing that just had to be dealt with over the course of my lifetime. I would say that there were moments and maybe this is what happens to people at the height of stress in those kinds of like life or death moments where I was able to watch what was happening. I was able to feel an energy around me that lifted me up and out of it. And I was able to I mean, some people would say it was God. I don't know. But that there was just a sense that there were spirits, there were there was just energy around me that was buffering me from the terror of what was happening. So I would offer for me, because I am an, I'm an atheist's daughter and I don't, you know, like that the paranormal hasn't been something that's been present in my life. But when those in those times and one time in particular where I felt like I can't explain it, I just felt the presence of something else that was it was like sparkling it was Mm. like all around me sparkling and it was protecting me from what otherwise would have been an absolutely terrifying experience i don't know is that paranormal i don't know that might that's probably not that interesting but i'll say it counts um, okay thank you thank you (laughs) that's why i asked the question you just never know what someone's experiences have been or what they believe it's just always cool to hear thank you justin (laughs) well so khalid just to put a big bow on everything uh what's on the horizon for you is there anything you can share without getting in trouble interesting question uh i did have an appearance on a show that I guess I can't talk about because it hasn't come out yet. But I'm excited about that because it's a very popular show. But (laughs) that's all I'll say. (laughs) Um, But but other than that, you know, I'm just trucking along. I'm I'm hoping there isn't a writer's strike, but I suspect there will be one. I'm really looking forward to, there's three more episodes of Waco to see. And it streams on Friday night and then airs on Showtime at 10 p.m. on Sunday. 
And it is, there's some real stuff happening in the upcoming episodes. I believe it'll probably be the final episode that I'm just super excited about because it's a big moment for my character and I just think I'm excited about it. And beyond that, you know, I'm a mom, I have two kids and I make jewelry on Etsy and I have my art class where I'm looking at nude bodies and sketching all the, all the curves and crevices. (laughs) Um, and then I'm just waiting to see what happens. You know, I'm really curious. I, I, I feel like good things are in store. I've had an amazing career, an amazing life. I feel very, very, very grateful for everything that's led me to this moment. Well, that's awesome. Kali, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm going to cut you loose so you can, you know, go <laughs> paint some crevices or whatever it is you're going to do the rest of the day. <laughs> it, it's, best, it's best we sign off on that. <laughs> thank you so <laughs> Thank you so much, Justin. I really appreciate it. It. These are really, really good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you have a great rest of your day. You as well. Be well. Right, Take bye-bye. care. All right, folks. That's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Kali. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back next time. Monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.